Greetings adventurers and welcome back to Abnormal Voyages. My name is David and today we are in Sarasota, Florida at the Ringling Circus Museum. Tag along as we experience the sights and sounds of one of the greatest shows on earth. Few things in this world are filled with as much fun, imagination, and magic as the circus. The first modern day circus started in 1768 by Philip Astley, and ever since then, people have flocked to wherever those colorful tents have set up, and they've gazed at the wonders within. Of course, with that many decades of time, what the circus looks like and has been is a little different, but that's what this museum is dedicated to, to showing us the history of the circus and all the wonderful people that have been a part of this story from the very beginning stretching to modern day. We begin our dive into circus history by looking at some old advertisements that were put up. These were different posters just showing off the acts that were coming and anything really to start getting people excited to let them know that this amazing thing was coming to town and they had to be there. A lot of these early advertisements are from the Sells Brothers, more formally known as the Sells Brothers Quadruple Alliance Museum Menagerie Caravan and Circus, which is quite a mouthful. They ran their circus from 1872 all the way up to 1895. You'll also see a couple of advertisements here for the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, which of course became the circus that I think it's fair to say most people are most intimately familiar with and have probably gotten to see sometime in their life. In this collection of old circus advertisements, we even had some newspapers and things that were put out on the streets that they had here in a nice little display that you could kind of flip through and look at just who was headlining and what acts you could expect to be coming to town soon. The printing process was a little different back then, and they utilized these big printing blocks to get all these colorful images and words right on the page. I think it's amazing that these blocks have actually survived throughout the years and still managed to be in pretty good shape. But now let's jump to an amazing creation that was inspired by the circus. This here is a mock-up of Howard Tibbles' workshop. One of his crowning achievements was a massive miniature circus that we're going to go take a look at right now. As you may have seen from previous episodes of Abnormal Voyages, we are most certainly fans of really well done miniatures, and this circus takes the cake. Officially called the Howard Brothers Circus, this entire massive replica is a 3 4 inch to the foot scale replica of a great big circus set in the 1920s. The creator, Howard Tibbles, actually modeled this off of a Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey circus. He even went to the Ringling management and asked them if he could put their name on his miniatures. Unfortunately, they declined. But that didn't stop Howard, and he just decided to name it after himself. So thus, the Howard Brothers Circus was born. Howard's love for the circus and trying to build miniature versions of it stretch all the way back to 1943 when he was only seven years old. However, the true work on the circus didn't really start until 1956. That's when he sat down and got serious about it. It ended up being completed by about 1974, so about 20 years, but nobody actually saw it until 1982, 
where this circus was debuted at the World Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee. Another 22 years after that, in 2004, the circus was moved to its current location here in the Ringling Museum, and I am certainly glad that it was. Even with the circus being completely built, it took Tibbles about a year to set this up here in the current location. It's actually not surprising that it took so long to set this up here. Just looking at it, you can see all the little details, all the little nuances in every single figurine. As a matter of fact, this circus contains 42,143 items altogether. And that doesn't include super small pieces, such as the railroad stakes and everything that's in it. So just taking those out of the box, that's going to take a long time by itself. The stats on this little circus are pretty astronomical. It consists of eight large tents, 152 circus wagons, 1,500 workers and performers, 7,000 folding chairs, and more than 500 hand-carved animals. That's astounding. You may also notice little screens playing footage here. Those are actually displays with documentary footage of circus life back in the 1920s and the 1930s. So you get a genuine glimpse into that era as you're looking at the little circus. There's seven different stations like that set up throughout the Howard Brothers Circus. Something I thought was really interesting about this is that every single piece can be packed up and put into the 55 train cars that are included here. So just like a real circus, if it ever comes time to hit the road, they can pack up in their train and be on their way. There are about 42,000 figures in this entire circus. The tallest one currently is the Sideshow Giant, and he stands at 6 and 1 8 inches. And of course, with such a massive circus show to put on, the crew gets very, very hungry. So, Howard actually built 900 sets of miniature silverware and dishes that you can see in the commissary tent, just waiting to help fill the bellies of all those circus performers. Having worked on this since he was a teenager, it's no secret that Howard is a massive fan who loves the circus more than probably anybody else around. He loves it so much that Howard actually helped invest in this very museum. He's donated over $15 million of his own money to see the history of the circus preserved and shared with all future generations. So not only did he invest his own money and build this entire circus by himself, but he wants to keep growing it. He insists that it's still not complete and that there are still pieces missing of what would have been a complete circus of the 1920s. Howard is quite the stickler for details. If you put a photo of the 1920 circus up to the model, you'll see that it matches exactly even the rivets are just the way they were back in the older days. If this circus were life-size, it would spread about 11 acres of land. But enough about facts and numbers. Let's follow the crowd and see the big show for ourselves. All the eager guests would funnel into this first tent here. We'll go ahead and move around. I also really like that outside you can see the men hammering in the stakes to keep the tent up. They would take turns so that it would go really fast. It would go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, which is pretty cool. Now on the inside of this first tent, it was like a little zoo almost, where all of the attendees would be able to see the animals 
that were in the show. So you had your elephants, your tigers, your lions, horses, giraffes, a lot of exotic animals that people back then did not get to see very commonly. So this was kind of the appetizer before you got to go into the actual big show. They're a little hard to see, but if you look in the background, there's a bunch of elephants all lined up getting ready to march out there together. Outside of this main tent and walkway, you would find a little backstage area just to maybe grab a quick snack or relax before rushing in to take care of the show. And now that everybody was properly excited, it was time to sit down and watch the actual circus. Here we finally are, under the big top at the Three Rings Circus, and the show is in full swing. Lions roaring, trapeze artists flying through the air, horses dancing. This is what the circus is all about, and the crowd is grabbing their seats to watch the show. In this scene, you'll notice everything from cotton candy vendors to silly clowns and graceful lions. I think it's incredible how many trapeze artists are actually all up in the air in this scene, as well as the fact that the horses were actually moving around in circles. It really added that extra special touch. It's also really cool how each individual person in this audience happens to have either something in their hand or are reacting to something happening out on the floor. Lots of little details. You could probably spend hours on this one scene alone and find new things in every corner. Outside of the big top, we see more of the backstage life and where the performers are hanging out. There's actually some folks over here trying to sneak a peek underneath the tent. Some of these smaller areas were used for training and kind of exhibition of the circus where folks from the public could come and watch the little acts getting ready before their big debut in the big show. This was a painting center where those wonderful posters were made. And not too far away from all this was where they kept the horses. They of course didn't build anything like stables because they were always on the move, so instead they erected a big tent, threw down a lot of hay, and let the horses relax and eat and sleep right here underneath the canvas. The golden age of circus was certainly a different time than what we live in now, but I think that imagination and magical feeling is something that we can all relate to. As we slowly pan out of the circus and back into the small town, it just kind of reminds us that an ordinary day could be completely transformed when the circus came to town. And I think that's a spark well worth remembering and holding on to. It's awesome that we get to see a model like this that really helps transport us back to that wonderful time and kind of shows us what it was like and how that feeling must have felt. And, just to give you an overall scope of how massive this miniature circus is, we have an aerial view. And this still isn't the entire circus. So you can tell it was quite the undertaking for him to build this. But let's move on and learn about the actual history of the circus. While the modern day circus got its start in the 1700s, the idea of circus has its roots much further back, stretching to the ancient Greeks. In Europe, traveling entertainers became commonplace and very beloved. This tradition of troubadours soon took hold, and in the 1700s they came along and made it an official show, and thus the first modern circus was born. And of course with the modern circus, nobody was as famous as P.T. Barnum. Perhaps the greatest showman to ever live, P.T. Barnum brought new character and flair to the world of circus. Always eager to show the public something new and amazing, 
P.T. Barnum eventually wound up joining forces with the Barnum and Bailey Circus, and they formed the greatest show on earth. This blind monkey statue was for calling cards at Barnum's house, along with other furniture that wasn't quite as unique, but still fancy and showed that he had pretty good status when he was around. All of these artifacts came from Barnum's house, so these are the actual things that he owned and used in his everyday life. Something really interesting were these pictures of Tom Thumb's wedding. Tom Thumb was, of course, a little person that P.T. Barnum had found and highlighted as one of his star attractions. To get an idea of just how small Tom Thumb was, this was his chair, a set of boots that he wore, and his little outfit, all very, very tiny. He may have been small, but he loomed large in people's minds. Moving on were some artifacts from George Demott, who was one of the world's most famous clowns, jugglers, entertainers. He performed for about 45 years, touring all over North America. And then we had pieces from Merle Evans, who gave that famous drum roll before very dramatic things happened at the circus. Here's his portrait, and he was named the bandmaster of the greatest show on earth. The golden age of circus had arrived. This was the time period when the circus was the most exciting thing you could do. This was the late 1800s. It was before movies were out there. It was before TV shows and internet. It was when the circus coming to town was something you looked forward to all year, where you got to go and see the stars, the celebrities, the amazing acts and animals that waited for you underneath those canvas tents. This was the time when circuses thrived. And most importantly, it's when the Ringling Brothers met up and joined Barnum and Bailey. As a sort of spin-off to the traditional circus, Wild West shows also became very popular in the early 1900s. People were amazed by what could be out there in that western land. So, they brought them stories of Indians and cowboys and outlaws. There were shooting displays, people using horses for tricks and lassoing. It was very interesting, not really something that stuck around for too long. But Wild West shows seemed like they were a lot of fun. And at that point, when a lot of the country hadn't been able to actually visit the West and see what it was all about, this was a great way to kind of bring a little of that culture to the rest of the country. And that brings us roughly up to modern day. The show must go on. Even though there's a lot more competition these days for people's attention and people's dollars, the circus spirit is still something that I think lives on in everyone. Wanting to see those amazing sights, seeing those animals, getting to see the amazing things that people can do is something that I don't think will ever go away. Even though circuses such as the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, Greatest Show on Earth may not be around right now, I think they're going to find a way to come back and I think circuses will continue to inspire and awe people of all generations. Even though this is many decades from the original circuses, you can see the inspiration from the older ones and how they've continued into today. Even the costumes themselves aren't that different from what somebody might have worn back in the early 1900s. It's got that color, that flair, just that really attention-getting look. I think it's fantastic that we have these preserved, and hopefully they will continue to make such wonderful things as these. I suppose the closest that we have to these outfits that are on stage right now is probably something in Vegas. The golden age of circus is probably the time that springs to most people's minds when they think of circus history, and they certainly didn't disappoint with a vast display that had tons of artifacts from that exact period. 
This display here was one of my favorites, even though it's really small. Just the way that it was cut out and has that 3D depth is mind-blowing. Not quite as mind-blowing. For some reason, we had on display P.T. Barnum's socks. All right. Then we had this wonderful little clown puppet here. I suppose he could be seen as a little creepy, but as long as he stays behind the glass, I don't mind it. These were more printing blocks used in the advertisements and handbills that were given out about the circus coming to town or what you were about to see before your very eyes. Again, I'm surprised that so many of these managed to make it this long in such good shape. I mean, they look like you could use them today. While there were various bits and bobs from performances, this hand really grabbed my attention. This was a fake hand used to conduct seances so that you could actually trick people by using it to tap on the table so they would think that there was a ghost nearby. Another very important aspect of circus life was water. Being on the road, they only had so much of it, so everybody was allocated a certain amount of buckets per day. There were more examples of that amazing circus art with those vivid colors that really drew you in. And one of the coolest examples was this here, which was a one-man band with this clever contraption. One person could operate it and have an entire symphony of music pouring out of this artistically painted device. Next to that was a fully restored Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey ticket booth. Customers would be able to come right up to the window here and grab their ticket to see the show. Inside there was a desk, they had a little safe there for the money they collected, and this is where some people would spend their entire day while the circus was in town, just helping people get those tickets and get on in. And in that same vein, here were the metal cases where the tickets bought would be taken and put in. They'd tear the tickets and throw the stub right in here. Some more advertisements for the circus, this time in newspaper, so that people could actually see what was coming to town and get excited about it. And in the room next to that, they highlighted the actual performers and workers of the Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus in 1921. This was a headshot of every single person that was part of the circus that year. Circus wagons are such an iconic piece of what the circus is and what people think of when they think circus. I know it was one thing seeing them as miniatures, but here in person, full size, you really got to take in how great these would have looked if you walked into a field one day and there was just 20 or 30 of them all hanging about. All the different art and details on them. It must have been extremely exciting the day that you saw these coming into town. And then this truck here was the human cannonball truck. They would actually put somebody in there and fire them off. Sideshows have always been a massive part of the circus life. And this was some advertisements of all the oddities you get to see inside. Now usually this was a separate tent from the actual big circus and people would pay a little additional fee to get to go inside and see them. Here was another circus wagon that I really enjoyed. The red and gold I think are just iconic. Along with all the wheels that you could see highlighted the art. Wagons were important in moving stuff around as well as trains. Speaking of trains... This is the Wisconsin, a restored train car where John Ringling and his wife spent their days while out on the road with the circus. You may not think it, but life on the rails living in a train could be quite luxurious. As the owner of one of the most successful circuses of all time, John Ringling certainly didn't skimp when it came to having comfortable accommodations. The Wisconsin happened to have pretty much any room you would have in a regular house. They were just strung together in a straight line and put on rails so that it could move around. From a sitting room to kitchens to bedrooms, 
This train honestly had pretty much everything that you could ever want. Now, due to it needing to be on a train, I suppose some of the rooms were a little tinier than someone might want in a house, but it was still something that was much higher up in luxury than the majority of people on the train, or even in many of the small towns that they would visit. As a matter of fact, the Ringlings were even able to host guests who could join them in their train car, either for a night of games and dinner, even a spare bedroom for people to spend the night in, or really anything that they could want, they could do here in the train. It was probably a very difficult life, constantly living on the go, moving from one city to the next, never staying anywhere for very long. So I have to imagine that having these comforts of home really made things a little easier on them and made it so that traveling from place to place to place didn't drive them crazy. Looking down the hall, you can see how everything kind of was offshooted of that main thoroughway there. And then even the outside had these very nice fancy looking windows. It may not be an ideal way to live, but I can guarantee it was probably quite the adventure. Ultimately, the circus is something special and unique that I think resonates within all of us in different ways. From the color, the spectacle, the sheer fun and excitement, the circus is something that deserves to live on and be remembered and cherished. Let's hope that soon we can have a second golden age of circus and have this imagination and magic in our lives again. Well, just like us, it looks like the circus is packing up and getting ready to hit the road for some more adventures. My name is David. This has been Abnormal Voyages. We'll see you in the next one.